All right, so let me get going and talk about IETF 88, which happened last week in Vancouver, British Columbia. How many people were aware there was an IETF meeting happening last week? All right, some people. Okay, good, that's good, that's a good group. Yes, and some people were there in the room. <laughs> How many of you were at IETF Vancouver? All right, number of folks who are there. So the ITF is the Internet Engineering Task Force, which is the organization that comes together and creates the open standards that really power the Internet. Uh, it's been around now for 30-some-odd uh, years and is the, uh, really the, the premier organization. And the beautiful part about the ITF is anybody can be involved. You just have to, you can join a mailing list. You just, it's, it's a, anybody can participate. It's not governments. It's not corporations. It's not it's it just people are there as individuals and can participate as individuals and do so and can work in that way. There were around 1,200 participants that were there from 54 countries. There were many more who were participating remotely as well, and they were able to, uh, to go and see that. As was mentioned by a couple of the earlier speakers, both Jim and Tim mentioned the fact that pervasive security or pervasive monitoring and large-scale surveillance and how we respond to that were a very large focus of this week, and I'll talk a bit more about that as we go through that. Uh, on the screen, on these slides, you'll see a, a link to where you can find some of the posts that we put up, the articles this past week, about the ITF 88 event, some of the sessions that you could pay attention to, the routing and, and the other pieces that were there, and also links to the video and some of the other pieces that were on there. Now, one of the great things about IPv6 at the IATF event was really that it's now just, it's IP. We don't talk about IPv6 as much, although it's just kind of when you're thinking about, you know, what is going on with the internet protocol, people just are in the standards organization, they're looking at it from an IP, IPv6 point of view kind of automatically. And so IPv6 is spread throughout all of the different groups across there. And in every group that I was in, there was often somebody talking about what was going on with, with IPv6. Some of the major working groups that are, that are going on within the IETF are uh, at some of the ones I've listed here. IPv6 operations. And this is one I would encourage all of you to take a look at. And we have some links later, but you can also just do a search online and look for the, IP, or the V6 Ops working group within the IETF. There's a mailing list that you can subscribe to. There's pages that have the documents that are, that are there, and I'll show you a little bit about that in a minute. There's an archive of, of mailing conversations. One of the key pieces is that from an ITF point of view, we'd really like to hear from operators about what are some of the issues with some of these standards, how can they really work in, in actual deployment, and feedback on some of the new standards that are being developed and some of the new ways people are working. We'll talk, show you a bit more around that, but your feedback is actually critical at this point in time. Because we're looking at how do we get, really get some of these IPv6 pieces. Some of the work that's happening right now is looking at IPv6 is out there. What are some of the tweaks that we need to do to make it more deployable? How do we make it work in different environments? What can we do? So as you look at IPv6 deployment, we, being the IETF, would really like to hear from operators around what, uh, what you're seeing out there. So some of the other groups that are here. There's uh, the six man or six maintenance, IPv6 maintenance group, and they're ones who are looking at kind of updates to the actual protocol specification itself and pieces that are there. Uh, HomeNet is, very, is an interesting aspect because you're looking at when you have a home network that we all have, how do you really focus on making it as easily configurable? You know, the, the goal of zero configuration, zero conf. How do we go and make it so that people can just take their devices, plug them in in their home network, and, and just have them work? You know, I can take my mobile phone or my mobile device and go onto my home network and be able to print something to the printer that I just brought home from the store. How do I make all of that work? And a number of the solutions that people are using right now are looking at using it with IPv6. And they're doing it even on what might be an IPv4 only LAN, but they're using IPv6 mechanisms as the discovery and the communication mechanism within that environment. There's also some work going on in that group and a couple others around what happens when I have two different home networks and I want to go and, and communicate. I want to be able to, you know, I might go on to my friend's network and I want to be able to, from that network, go back to my home network and pull files from there 
or print to, or if I'm at my home, I want to be able to print to my friend's printer or something like that. How do you secure that? How do you make sure that you know, only I can do that or whoever my friend has, been, has given permission? How do I go from one home to another and, and one home network to another when I'm browsing? There's another group called OPSEC or Operational Security, which is looking at security issues related to the operations of the internet. And in this particular meeting last week, they had a couple of drafts related very specifically to IPv6 security and how and some components of how to make it more secure in deployment environments. So all very uh, good stuff for you to take a look at and understand there. There's another group, it actually did not meet this time last week, but it's called Sunset 4, and it's a group that's focused around sunsetting IPv4 on what happens as we wind down IPv4 deployments and move toward IPv6, what are some of the pieces that need to happen? And so some of the work around CGN and some of the other different pieces around that are happening in that group and the pieces that are there. So here's a glimpse, it's probably a little bit hard to see from back there, but it's some of the pieces that were discussed at the V6 operations group, just to give you a sense of what was being talked about. There was a, a very interesting talk by Chris Palmer from Microsoft around Xbox One and Teredo and how Xbox One is using IPv6 for uh, enabling peer-to-peer -peer communication between the people who are communicating and some of the, the components that are there. And it talked about uh, uh, something related to sort of what Tim was talking about around customer premise equipment. How do you secure that in an IPv6 environment? There's one, a draft called balanced security for that. NAT 6.4 operational experiences was somebody, you know, cataloging what they'd done in that environment and when working with that space on that. Uh, the 464 XLAT, uh, this is something, I don't know how many of you are aware of T-Mobile recently, you know, moving a lot of its devices to IPv6 only. And so they're actually running for the devices that can in an IPv6 only environment. And they're using this technology called 464XLAT to be able to go and have those v6 only devices communicate with the rest of the IPv4 network. And in fact, we have an article that will be going up this week that Jan wrote talking about his experience using Skype in an, on an IPv6 only device but it was communicating back to the rest of the network using this technology called 464XLAT to be able to work with that. So there's some very interesting work that was going on in there. You can see some other pieces that were down here, some drafts where they'd done around IPv6 roaming, some other addressing issues, and looking at ideas around how do we work with uh, IPv6 address in there. So this is just one of the working groups that, that was there last week. And so I guess part of my message to you all is there's a lot of really good stuff going on out here. Some of these documents will become RFCs, and you'll see them out there as official standards, or some will be informational RFCs, which are just documents that are published for the information of you all. But they, there may be, as you look at how do you move your networks into IPv6 or in the, the other pieces that are here, um, this is a good resource for you to take a look at. So I would encourage you to do that. On the DNS slash DNSSEC side, the, there was one group that met that was called uh, DNS Op. It's the DNS operations working group. So again, looking at it from a very operational perspective. And earlier, Jacques was talking about CIRA and this challenge of as you roll out domains in DNSSEC, if, if I'm a registrant or if I'm a DNS operator and I go and update my key as I'm supposed to at, you know, on some periodic basis, how do I get that key up to, in Jacques' case, .ca? How do I get it up to the TLD registry? Okay, when I'm a DNS operator, I don't have any real connection to the registry. I don't know them. I've registered my domain through some registrar, but I have no connection to it. Right now, a lot of that is through copy and paste web interfaces where I go in my DNS operator and I copy my DS record and I go to my registrar's web page and I paste in my DS record. How's that working for you? I mean, that's, yeah, yeah let's hope it works. Yes, please. Um, did I copy the right numbers? But that's the reality of, of how some of this, that's one spot that needs to be automated in the DNS area. And there was some excellent proposals that have been discussed and, and are moving forward on how do we make that happen as an industry. Uh, there were some other, there were some other uh, drafts and documents being discussed around the issue of how do we speed up uh, DNS? and DNS resolution, because as we enter into a space where we're using DNSSEC, we're getting larger responses, we're getting multiple responses to go and do that. And actually, Paul, right here, was uh, wrote, wrote a couple of the drafts. You want to raise your hand, Paul? You can, right here, okay? So Paul was one who wrote a number of those drafts around how do we speed up DNS? 
How do we make it work faster and more efficiently in that? And so those were some of the drafts that were being discussed in there. Uh, there was also uh, an, another meeting. We had a side meeting about the Dane protocol. And this is something that Jim Galvin referred to in his presentation when he talked about how DNS could be used to secure SSL certificates and how you could put a fingerprint of your SSL certificate into the DNS so that when you are, are connecting to a website, a web browser, for instance, could get a TLS and, or what we commonly call an SSL, but a TLS certificate down from the website it could also retrieve a fingerprint from DNS, look at the two of them and say, am I connecting to the right site with the right certificate? Do I have the correct certificate? So it's using D DNS to provide, and DNS and DNSSEC to provide an extra layer of security on top of the certificate system. So we can know, am I getting the correct certificate? You know, that fancy certificate somebody may have paid for, if somebody's redirecting to another website, they're not getting to your certificate. But DNS and DNSSEC, and specifically this Dane protocol, allow that. Uh, to, to work, to provide that trust layer. And people are looking at Dane for a lot more than web browsing. People are using it at looking at a way to provide certificates for email and for IM, for voice over IP phones, for a number of different, modular, modu different ways of communicating. So it was a very uh, useful uh, meeting that was going on there. And if, you know, if you're not familiar with Dane, I would point you to this URL I have up here, if you, or if you just go to the Deploy360 site and, and search on the Dane protocol, you'll find our page that talks about this. It's one of the most exciting uses of what we can do now that we start to have a secured infrastructure with DNSSEC. There was also another meeting that I didn't put on the slide, but it was just while well, I was talking about home networking, there's one called DNSSD, which is around service discovery, which is, again, if I have multiple home networks and I want to be able to find out that I want to be able to connect to somebody's file server on another network and they've granted me permission, how do I find that securely using DNS to go and provide a piece around that? There were also a number of uh, meetings around routing. Uh, Sandy, who is here, Right there. She is the chair of the, one of the co-chairs of the Secure Interdomain Routing Working Group, CIDR, which is, and she'll be up here in our routing panel a little while later. But this group is looking around, how do we secure the, the routing infrastructure of the internet? How are we, you know, sure that the routes that we're getting from each other are, are secure in some way? How do I know if I can trust them? They're looking at things like, how many people have heard of RPKI? Okay, a few people. Okay. RPKI is one technology people are looking at as one of the tools that can be used to go and secure the route. So when you are getting route advertisements, et cetera, when you're getting you know, messages in there, you can be able to be sure that they are, in fact, the, the right place to go. BGPSEC. How many people have heard of BGPSEC? Okay, a few. It's another way of securing the BGP routing protocol. So these are some pieces that are being looked at and deployed inside of here. And another group called the Interdomain Routing Group is similarly working on ways to route between different domains, between different networks. So if you're interested in this area and how you can keep up with where the standards are going and what's happening, these are both groups that you can go and pay attention to. The other big focus this week, which you may have heard about and was referenced by a couple of speakers, was really focusing on how do we strengthen the internet against the kind of large-scale, pervasive monitoring and, and uh, surveillance that we've seen. I mean, we've all seen the media reports. We've seen it around the NSA, around other organizations, you know, surveillance organizations around the world, and looking at that. And we had an entire plenary, one of the major sessions, it was an hour and a half session, talking about what have we done, you know, what do we know out there, what can we, what can we do as a technical community, realizing that the, the technical aspects are only part of the overall solution. You know, solving these kind of large-scale monitoring issues are not going to be something that could be done just purely technically. There's legal and political elements as well. But if you go to the URL that I put on here, it's just www.ietf.org slash live slash IETF88, you can see the links to the plenary session, the video that was had, and also the slides and a number of other articles that are around this. But Bruce Schneier, who many of you know, may know as an author and speaker, and t security researcher, he came and spoke first talking about what do we know? He's been very involved in some of the, in some of the publicity around the disclosures, working with some of the newspapers and other media around the Snowden disclosures and other pieces around that. And he gave a great summary around that. And then he was followed by leaders from within the IETF talking about what the IETF has done, what standards are out there, and then really looking at where are we going? 
The outcome of that was that as you went through the week and you looked at the different working groups, there was a lot of discussion around how do we strengthen the security of the internet? How do we harden it against this kind of large-scale pervasive monitoring while at the same time you know, ensuring it continues to be usable? You know, how do we go and work with this? How do we move to more of a secure by default posture rather than just more, a general more insecure by default? What can we do there? Yari Arko, who's the chair of the IETF, wrote a blog post that I link to up here, or I show a link to here, but you can also just go to ietf.org slash blog and you could find it there where he summarized a lot of the work that's happening. There's work going on with the next version of HTTP, the hypertext transfer protocol that we're all used to using for the web around how to make that more secure. There's people looking at how do we go and make TLS used in more environments and more places. How do we go and secure the overall infrastructure? It was a you know, huge part of what was being discussed last week. So let me just wrap up with uh, last week. If you're interested, the ITF page at the ITF has a whole series of in documents, the agenda, the meeting materials, all of that around ITF 88. You can go there and download them. The slides that were used in the various sections are all right up there. Again, we had our posts around these topics. And also, there was, again, this technical plenary. If I were to recommend one thing to you, I would encourage you to go out there and take a look at this. Even just watching the first part of it where it talks a bit about the, uh, the kind of what the threats are and what we can do is a very, I think, would be a very worthwhile part of time for you to take a look at that. With that, I would just encourage you all, as I did, said at the beginning, we need help from the operators. We need to look at that as far as we need your feedback on these documents that are out there. How, you know, how can we make better standards that are deployed out there faster? You have a unique opportunity because the IETF is, again, involves you. It's all of us. It's people who want to be part of it. You don't have to be part of an industry consortium. You don't have to be part of a government. You don't have to be part of any, you just, you can go and join a mailing list, listen to what's there, read it. The, one of the best things you can do, the most helpful things, read some of the documents and send the authors some feedback. Even if you just send them a, a feedback saying, hey, I looked at this, it was good, I like it, thanks. That's huge, just to help. Or if you look at this and say, you know what, that's a really brilliant idea, but you know what, in my network here in Canada, it's not gonna work. This is dead. Don't even, you know, don't even bother going further with this because it's not gonna work on my network. That kind of feedback is tremendous because that helps us so that when we then, otherwise what happens is the standard goes on and comes out and then all of a sudden it doesn't get deployed. People are like, why didn't it get deployed? Because you all go and you look at this and you're like, well, I can't do this. It just won't work. So please, join. There's the, uh, this newcomers page has some information about the IETF and the pieces that are there. And in particular, I'll recommend two groups to you, which are the IPv6 operations and the DNS operations group are both good ones for you folks to take a look at because you're coming from that perspective.